What's going on, moviegoers, movie lovers? Mr. Filmstock here, and welcome to another episode of the Mr. Filmstock Podcast. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the MPA, the Motion Picture Association, or the MPAA, the Motion Picture Association of America. Now, as you have noticed, I have not been really talking about certain specific topics. It's been all over the place, and that's because I'm touching on topics on my podcast that have not been talked about in any other entertainment podcast, movie podcast, TV podcast, you name it. It has not been talked about. So I'm here to give you a history about the MPA from when it began up until today. I have my footnotes right in front of me and we're going to get into it and we're going to get started right now. The Motion Picture Association is an American trade association representing the major five film studios of the United States and these five film studios or these members are Warner Brothers, Walt Disney Studios, Universal Pictures, Sony Pictures, Paramount Pictures, and Netflix. It was founded in 1922, almost 102 years ago. The chairman and CEO now is Charles Rivkin and it's from, it was kind of, you know, founded in 1922. As I stated, it was the Motion Picture Producers and Distributions of America, the MPPDA. And then it went on to become the MPAA from 1945 until September 2019. Its original goal was to ensure the viability of the American film industry. In addition, it also established guidelines for film content which resulted in the creation of the Motion Picture Production Code in 1930. This code, also known as the Hayes Code, was replaced by Film Rating System in 1968, which is managed by the CARA, the Classification and Rating Administration. Now, the early history of the MPA, we have, it was founded and is a trade association, as I stated, by the member of the motion picture companies. And it was founding members, companies, approximately about 70 to 80 percent of the films made in the United States. General William H. Hayes, or Postmaster General, former Postmaster General William H. Hayes, was named the first association's president. Now, the main focus of this in its early years was on producing a strong public opinion and relations campaign to the studios in Hollywood, which kind of remained financially stable and able to attract investments from Wall Street kind of, you know, financially stable and being attracted to investments in Wall Street still stands today, but it's not as big as it was about a hundred years ago. Now, simultaneously ensured that American films had a clean moral tone. Well, of course, we know that's changed a few times in the last lots of decades. The MPPDA also instituted a code of conduct. Now, this code of conduct for Hollywood actors in an attempt to govern their own behavior on screen or off screen as well. Finally, the code sought to protect American film interests by encouraging film studios to avoid racist portrayals of foreigners. So that was a big, big deal. Now, today as so, the organization that has shaped the content and distribution and even the political landscape of the film industry for nearly a century. Uh, the history of it, the aspect of it, and the growth and the early Hollywood need for the regulation of things really, really stead the time and really, really pushed forward the aspect of the public and government pressure for regulation. Now, the initial goal and the self-regulation really, really kind of changed over course of time. Being with that, the early days of the association, kind of William H. Hayes spoke out against public censorships and it kind of worked to raise support from the general public for the film industry's efforts against censorship, which is a really, really big deal back in the day and even right now, which is still going on with censorship. At the time, the MPPDA's founding, there was no national censorship at all in the early 1920s up until 1929. Being so, as such, in certain locations in the U.S., films were often edited to comply with these regulation and codes. Not only that, it had the aspect of the on-screen portrayal of violence and sexuality, among other 
topics that even today are still a big, big issue. This resulted in negative publicity, huge negative publicity for the studios and increasing number of theater and movie going audiences who were uninterested in films that were sometimes so edited that they didn't make any sense or they were incoherent and didn't follow the storyline subject. In 1929, more than 50% of American moviegoers lived in a location overseen by such a broad aspect of censorship. Now, in 1924, Hayes instituted so-called, quote-unquote, the formula, a loose set of guidelines for filmmakers in the industry. Now, in an effort to get the movie industry to self-regulate themselves, the issues that the censorships boards had had to be created to address. The formula requested that the studios send synopsises of films being considered for review. So that's where the term film synopsis comes from. This effort largely kind of failed in a big, big way. However, as studios were under certain litter obligations and kind of send their scripts to the Hayes office nor to follow his recommendations. Then three years later in 1927, he oversaw the creation of a code don'ts and be carefuls for the industry, which kind of doesn't have a good ring to it if you really, really think about it. The list outlined that the issues that movies could encounter in different localities or locations for that matter. He also created a studio relations department, the SRD, with staff available to these movie studios for script reviews and kind of advice regarding potential problems, what these censorships could have. Again, despite his efforts, studios largely ignored the Don'ts and Be Carefuls Act, and by the end of 1929, the MPPDA received only 20% of Hollywood scripts prior to their production, and the number of these regional and local censorships board continued to increase. Now, the aspect of all of this, it had a big impact on the filmmaking prowess, filmmakers and writers. I mean, can you imagine today something like this happening and you have to send in your script for certain reasons of violence or racism or censorship or sexual, you know, innuendos in that. But it's more freer now than it was close to a hundred plus years ago. Not only that, you have what is the production code from 1930 to 1934. In 1930, the MPPDA, in a way, introduced a motion picture production code called the Hayes Code. Now, the code consisted of moral guidelines that were supposed to be followed regarding what was acceptable to include in films of that time. Remember, this is right after the talkies became a popular aspect in film and a new invention. After the Jazz Singer was released in 1927, three years later, you have the Hayes Code. Unlike the Don'ts and Be Carefuls Act or Law, which the studios ignored and the production code, which was endorsed by kind of studio executives. The code incorporated many of these don'ts and be carefuls uh, acts as specific examples would, could and not be portrayed. Among these other rules, the code prohibited includes scenes of passion unless they were essential to the film's plot. Just think about that for a little bit. Inclusion of scenes of passion unless they were essential to the film's plot. Pointed profoundly in either words or action, sexual provision, uh, justification of explicit coverage of adultery, sympathetic treatment of crime or criminals, dancing with indecent moves, and so-called quote-unquote, which has been stated in the Hayes Code, white slavery. Yes, you heard that correctly. Because of this, studio executives had to be involved in the decision to adopt this code. Now the MPPDA member studio were more willing to submit scripts for this reason and for the consideration of it. However, the growing economic impact of the Great Depression, which happened in 1929, of the early 1930s, also increased pressure on the film studios that would draw the largest possible audiences, even if it meant taking chances with local censorships boards by disobeying the code. Can you imagine disobeying the code back then and not having your movie going into production or being released, which was absolutely insane. 
Here is an interesting thing that happened three years later in 1933 and in 1934. The Catholic Legion of Decency, yes, the, you heard that correctly as well, along with a number of Protestant and women's groups, kind of launched plans to boycott films they, they deemed immoral and not right for society. In order to avert these kind of boycotts, the film industry, the MPPDA, created a new department which was the PCA, the Production Code Administration, with Joseph Breen as its head, who was an American film censor with the motion picture producers and distribution who applied the Hayes Code to film production. Unlike the previous attempts at these self-censorships, the PCA decisions were binding and no film could be kind of exhibited in an American theater or shown without a stamp of approval from the PCA and any producer attempting to do so faced a fine of up to $25,000. After 10 years of unsuccessful codes and expanding local censorship boards, the studio approved and agreed to enforce the codes nationwide, the production code, which was enforced starting on July 1st, 1934. Now, I want to go back to the Hayes Code, the Motion Picture Production Code, uh, which is basically, which was implied to most major motion picture studios in the U.S. from 1934 to get this 1968, so 34 years. Um, after William H. Hayes, the president of the MPPDA from 1922 to 1945, Hayes' leadership, later the Motion Picture and the Motion MPAA, adopted the code in 1930. Now, from 1934 to 1954, the code was closely identified with Joseph Breen, as I stated who he was. The administration appointed Hayes to enforce the code in Hollywood. Now, it really, really showed the aspect of what could be done with the Hayes Code. Now, the aspect of the don'ts in the don'ts and be carefuls, as proposed in 1927, were pointed profanity, number one, by either the title or lip that includes the words God, Lord, Jesus, or Christ, Hell, S-O-B, which of course you know is son of a bitch, Damn, God, G-A-W-D, and other profane and vulgar expressions, however it may be spelled on screen or said. Any suggestive nudity, in fact, or in silhouette, and therefore by other characters in the picture. Number three is the legal trafficking drugs. Four is the any interference of sex provision. Five, of course, is white slavery. Six is miscegenation. Seven is sex hygiene and venereal diseases. Eight is scenes of actual childbirth, in fact, or in the silhouette. Number nine is children's sex organs. Ten is ridicule of the clergy. And number 11, willful offense to any nation, race, or creed. That is the don'ts and be carefuls part of the don'ts and be carefuls code. Here is the be carefuls. It has 26 special exercise manner codes. This is the use of the flag, number two. International relations, number three. Religion and religious ceremonies, four is arson. Five is the use of firearms. Six is theft, robbery, safe cracking, dynamite of trains, mines, buildings, and etc., etc. Uh, number seven is the brutality and possible gruesomeness of humans. Number eight is technique of committing murder by whatever method deemed necessary. Number nine is methods of smuggling. Number 10 is third degree methods. 11 is actual hangings or electrocutions as legal punishment for crime. Number 12 is sympathy for criminals, <laughs> which is an interesting one. Number 13 is attitude toward public characters and institutions. Number 14 is sedation. Number 15 is apparent cruelty to children and animals. Number 16 is branding of people or animals. Number 17 is the sale of women or of women selling virtue. 18 is rape or attempted rape. Number 19 is first night scenes. Number 20 is men and women in bed together. Number 21 is deliberate seduction of girls. Number 22 is the institution of marriage. Number 23 is surgical operations. Number 24 is the use of drugs. 25 is titles or scenes having to do with law enforcement or law enforcement officers. And number 26 is excessive or lustful kissing, particularly when one character or the other is a heavy. Now, the heavy, basically, if you didn't know, is a villain.
which is what heavies were called back in the day. Of course, the code was divided into two parts, the first set of being a general principles, which prohibited a picture from being lowering the moral standards and the subsequent minds of the depictions of the correct standards of life. The second part was a set of particular applications, which was an exact listing of items that could not be depicted. So the aspect of this is really, really set in stone and set forward. Now you have what is called after 1934, the war years up until 1945. In the years immediately following, following the code and the adoption of this code, Breen often sent films back to Hollywood for additional edits if he did not seem fit or it did not seem fit for the right standards to release it to the movie theater going audience. Now, in so, in some cases, he simply refused to issue PC approvals for a film to be shown. And at this time, he kind of promoted the industry's new focus on wholesome films and continued promoting American films abroad for nearly three years. Studios complied with this code, but by 1938, however, as a threat of war in Europe loomed, movie producers began to worry what would happen if the possibility decreased and profits had gained increased abroad. This led to a decrease in investment in following the stricterness of these guidelines. That same year, responding to trends in European films and the run-up to the war, uh, Hayes spoke out against using movies as a vehicle for propaganda. So there you go, Hollywood being told by someone else how to make your movies. Can you imagine today if that happened? Well, I mean, you kind of have that aspect going on today, but it's not for so really seen like Breen did back in the 1940s. Now in 1945, after nearly 24 years as president, Hayes stepped down from his position of the MPPDA, although he continued to act as an advisor for the next five years. The fun thing about this is it's really, really interesting because after that came the Eric Johnston era. The MPPDA hired Mr. Johnson, four-time president of the United States Chamber of Commerce to replace Hayes. So this is kind of a government way of putting someone in saying, hey, you're going to watch this movie and we're going to edit it for you in your own manner. During his first year as president, he rebanded the motion picture producers and distributions of America as the MPAA or the MPA, which is now the Motion Picture Association or the Motion Picture Association of America. He also created the Motion Picture Export Association Act, or the MPEA, to promote American films abroad by opposing production monopolies in other countries. So they, they don't get money from the American profits, which was a really, really smart thing to do. Now, in 1947, the MPEA voted to discontinue certain shipments of film to Britain after the British government imposed an import tax on American films. Uh, Johnston negotiated with the British government to end the tax in 1948, and film shipments resumed. Now, he oversaw the first major revision of the production code since it was created in 1930, and this revision kind of, in a way, allowed the treatment of some subjects which had been previously forbidden during the Don'ts and Be Carefuls Act, a kind of including abortion and the use of narcotics, so long as they were within the limit of good taste. At the same time, the revision kind of added a certain number of new restrictions to this code, including outlawing the depiction of blasphemy and mercy killings in films. Johnston was very, very well liked by studio executives and his political connections. Yes, he had political connections, very, very big ones for that matter, which I will not get into, kind of helped him function as the effective liaison between Hollywood and Washington. And in 1963, while still serving as president of the Motion Picture Association of America, he died of a stroke. Now, for three years, they operated without a president while studio executives searched for a replacement. Then in 1966, they appointed uh, Jack Valenti, former aide to President Lyndon Johnson, as president of the MPAA. In 1968, he replaced a production code with a system of voluntary ratings in order to limit censorship of Hollywood films 
in order to provide parents with information about the appropriateness for films for children. So once the war ended, they started making more films for kids, be it so Walt Disney had a big push in the animation department and era where it was seen as how, how can we show films to young children by keeping it still safe. Now, in addition to concerns about protecting children, Valente stated in his autobiography that he sought to, in a way, ensure the American filmmakers could produce films that they wanted without the censorship that existed under the production code that had been in effect since 1934. So almost 30 years, 28 years later, it's kind of slowly changing its ways Valenti continued to fight piracy in a way, even establishing the Film Security Office in 1975, an anti-piracy division which sought to recover unauthorized recordings of films to prevent duplication. You know, or, you know, those back in the 90s when you had VHS tapes that were being filmed by people in movie theaters and then they sell it on the market for five bucks. Yeah, that that's what that was. Um... Then Valenti kind of way uh, asked Congress to install chips in VCRs that would prevent illegal reproduction of video cassettes, and in the 1990s supported law enforcement efforts to stop bootleg distribution of videotapes. Now Valenti also oversaw a major change in the rating system, where he sought the removal of the X rating, which had been closely associated with pornography, but it was replaced with the new rating the NC-17 rating in 1990. Now you have the Motion Picture Association film rating system, which is used in the United States and its territories to rate a motion picture's suitability for certain movie coding audiences based on its content. Now the rating system is a voluntary way that is not enforced by law, but films can be exhibited without a rating, although most theaters refute to exhibit non-rated films or NC-17 rated films. Non-members of the MPA may also submit films for ratings. In effect, as of 1968, following the Hayes Code of the Classical Hollywood Cinema Era or the Golden Age of Hollywood, the MPA rating system is one of the most various motion picture rating systems in all the world that are used to help parents decide what films are appropriate for children. It is administered by the CARA, the Classification of Ratings Administration, an independent division of the Motion Picture Association. Now, the MPA film ratings are as follows, and I know all of you listeners and viewers wanted me to get to this point, so here it is. You have the G rating, which is general audiences, all ages admitted, nothing that would offend parents or for viewing by children. Next up, you have the PG rating, rated PG. Parental guidance suggested some material may not be suitable for children. Parents are urged to give parental guidance. It may contain some material parents might not like for their young children. You have the PG-13 rating. Parents strongly cautioned. Some material may be inappropriate for children under 13. Parents are urged to be cautious and some material may be inappropriate for pre-teens. You have the rated R, restricted. Under 17 requires accompanying parent or adult guardian. Contains some adult material. Parents are urged to learn more about this film or the film before taking their children with them and it's not for children. And finally, you have the NC-17 rating adults only. No one 17 and under admitted, clearly adult children are not admitted at all. You have different aspects. You also have regulation of promotional material and releases. You have theatrical trailers, the green band trailer for suitable for all audiences, a, a yellow band trailer, which is used for internet trailers in a way which is some age appropriate, and the red band trailer for mature audiences where cursing is allowed and uh, the kind of yellow band trailer I will talk about is not really seen as often it was introduced in April of 2007 and it's kind of defined as certain things as however red, yellow band trailers are occasionally created and a notable example being the trailer for Rob Zombie's Halloween if you go back and you see the original trailer for Rob Zombie's Halloween, the remake of the Halloween Michael Myers movie in 2007, 
you'll see a few yellow band trailers. Now you have the green band trailer, which is we always see comes up. This following preview has been approved for appropriate audiences by the Mission Major Motion Picture Association of America. Then you have the red band trailer, which when the red band trailer comes up, the red card, it's a fun thing to do because you know it's going to be a fun trailer. Whether it be horror or comedy, they always have the red band trailer going. The MPA also created blue feature tags for theatrical and home media use and if you ever see the ending of the credits you see the MPA you see that certain aspects of uh, the theatrical or home video releases show a blue tag after the film with home video releases prior showing it to the film they feature the rating block of any content distributors where you could be in a way arrested for duplicating the aspect of the film that you're watching now this is the replacement of the Hayes Code and Jack Valenti who I mentioned before became president of the MPAA in 1966 which had been kind of and he changed things vigorously and filmmakers were pushed boundaries of the code with some even gaining as far filing lawsuits against the Hayes Code by invoking the First Amendment. Can you believe they did that? Yes, they did that. Valenti cited examples such as Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, which used prohibited language including Hump the Hostess and Blow Up, which was denied code approval due to nudity, resulting in MGM, then a member of the MPAA, releasing it through a subsidiary. Now, the aspect of the rating system from 1968 to 1970 were rated G, suggested for general audiences, rated M for mature audiences, rated R for persons under 16 not admitted, and rated X, persons under 16 not admitted. The National Association of Theater Owners urged the creation of an adults-only category, fearful of possible legal problems in local certain jurisdictions. The X rating was not an MPAA trademark and would not receive the MPAA seal. Any producer submitting a film for the MPAA rating could self-apply the X rating to their film. Now, in the 1970s, the age from R and X were raised from 16 to 17, and from M to GP to PG was created. The rating system used from 1970 to 1972 were rated G, rated GP, all ages admitted, rated R, and rated X. Then you have the rating system used from 1972 to 1984, and this is where things get very, very interesting. Rated G is general audiences, rated PG, you know what that is, rated R, and rated X. But in the 1980s, complaints of violence and gore in films really raised the standard, and the PG-13 rating was introduced because of two big blockbuster films of that era both of which were, in a way, Steven Spielberg's idea. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom and Gremlins, both of which received PG ratings, but refocused attention seen by younger children. According to author Philippa Antus, this revealed the conundrum of that film that could not be recommended for all children. Uh, Steven Spielberg, director of Temple of Doom and executive producer of Gremlins, suggested a new intermediate rating between PG and R. The PG-13 rating was introduced on July 1st, 1984 with the advisory, parents are strongly cautioned to give special guidance and attendance to children under 13. Some material and scenes may be inappropriate for young children. The first film to be released with this rating was John Millis' war film, Red Dawn. And then in 1985, the wording was simply simplified to parents strongly cautioned and around the same time the MPAA won a trademark infringement lawsuit yes during the 1980s against the producers of the distribution of I Spit on Your Grave. If you know what that film is then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Over fraudulent application of its R rating to, to the uncut rating version of that film and forced its member studios and several other home video distributions to put MPAA ratings on the packaging of the release to home video. Now, the rating system used from 1984 to 1990 were rated G, rated PG, rated PG-13, and rated R, and rated X. Now, in a weird sort of way, rated X replaced by NC-17. 
In the rating system early years, X-rated films such as Midnight Cowboy and A Clockwork Orange were understood to be unsuitable for children, but not pornographic, and it was intended for the general public. But if you watch Midnight Cowboy and A Clockwork Orange, those are very interesting films, so to speak. Now, however, pornographic films often self-applied this X-rating trademark. And in a way, in the late 1989 and early 90s films, respectively, such as Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, The Cook, The Thief, His Wife, and Her Lover, two critically acclaimed art films, which have a strong cult following, featured strong adult content, were released. And when I mean strong adult content, just watch those films and you'll see what I am speaking of. In 1990, the MPAA introduced the rating NC-17, no one under 17 admitted. The film Henry and June, previously to be an X rating, was the first film to receive the NC-17 rating. And of course, Henry and June is the film that was written and directed by Philip Kaufman and starred Fred Ward and Uma Thurman. Although films with an NC-17 rating had more mainstream distribution than X Rated films, many theaters refused to screen them because of a backlash. Most media conglomerates or entertainment media conglomerates did not accept advertising for them at all. Now, you have the ratings used from 1990 to 1996, which were rated G, rated PG, rated PG-13, rated R, and rated NC-17. And in 1996, the minimum age for NC-17 rating was raised to 18 by no one under 17 admitted. So now we have the same aspect, but now the ratings have been used since 1996 are rated G for general audiences, all ages admitted, rated PG for parental guidance suggested, rated PG 13, parents strongly cautioned, rated R for restricted, and rated NC 17. Since 1990, the MPAA has included explanations or descriptions of what an R rating is. For example, the description for The Girl Who Played With Fire read rated R for brutal violence, including rape and some strong sexual content and nudity. Now, by the early 2000s, things kind of changed a little bit. The MPAA began applying rating explanations for PG, PG-13, and NC-17 rating films as well. So the aspect of the sex, the substance abuse, the nudity is really, really different. But the biggest thing and the biggest film to have an effect on ratings was The Exorcist at the end of 1973. And I'm going to get into this story. Uh, at the time, the CARA president, Aaron Stern, took the unusual step of calling director William Friedkin of The Exorcist to tell him that since it was an important film, it will be rated R, but could be released without any cuts. The film drew huge crowds upon its release. And when it did so, you know the stories, you know what happened in December of 1973. Many of whom were so horrified that they vomited and or fainted at the movie theaters or during screenings or when the screenings were ending. A kind of psychiatric journal would later document the cases of cinematic neurosis induced by the film and probably the only film to do so in the history of major motion pictures. Now among these patrons were children not always accompanied by adults. Now can you imagine a 12, 13, 14, 15 year old going to see The Exorcist in 1973 and being like Oh, holy crap, what, what, what just happened? And being traumatized for the rest of your goddamn life. This left many people, kind of, and ratings board have found that the film with distribution scenes as a possessed 12-year-old girl, and you know the scene with the masturbation of the crucifix, was kind of acceptable for children to see back in the day. Now, Roy Meacham, a Washington, D.C. critic who appraised the film while kind of saying that parents not take their children to see it, recalled those children did not see did not see children leaving the showings uh, afterwards. They would look drained and drawn out afterward. Their eyes had a look I'd have never seen before, and they were just traumatized by this. Now, with that, uh, Meacham instituted that the board kind of had succumbed to pressure from Warner Brothers, which had spent $10 million, more than twice its original budget on the film, making the film an X rating, which have been seriously limited to the commercial aspect and profits of The Exorcist. Now, New York critic 
Pauline Kael echoed its criticism. If the exorcist, quote unquote, quote, if the exorcist had cost under a million or been made abroad, she wrote, it would almost certainly be an X film. But when a movie is a, as expensive as this one, the board doesn't dare give it an X rating, unquote. And then in 1974, Richard Afner took over as president of the board, and during this interview process, he had been asked to screen recent films that sparked rating controversies, including The Exorcist. How could anything be worse than this, he exclaimed. He recalled thanking later, and it got an R rating. And he overtook over a head, and he would spearhead efforts to more aggressive R ratings, especially over violence in films. In 1976, he got the board to give the Japanese martial arts film The Street Fighter, yes, The Street Fighter, the film that starred Sonny Chiba, an X rating for its graphic violence, the first time a film that earned rating purely for violence, which if you watch The Street Fighter, it's an absolute amazing martial arts film that stars Sonny Chiba and one of the biggest international films, and the violence is not that crazy. It's not graphic at all, but for what it's worth, it's a really, really fun film, and I highly recommend everyone see it. Not only that, the commercial viability of NC-17 ratings really, really hit a chord in 1995 with the film Showgirls, starring Elizabeth Berkley from Saved by the Bell. It became the most widely distributed NC-17 film ever, showing in 1300 plus cinemas simultaneously it was not a good film it's definitely not for kids and when you saw it, you're like whoa but it was a box office failure that only grows 45 percent of its 45 million dollar budget which is really really bad especially put that today to against today's numbers absolutely atrocious now some successes can be found in theatrical you know releases but the the way showgirls really really absolutely changed the NC-17 rating. I mean, directed by Paul Verhoeven and written by Joe Esterhaus, and Joe Esterhaus is known for writing NC-17 films. Showgirls is still the most number one box office NC-17 film of all time. Now, there have been some inconsistencies and certain standards with independent studios, especially with the NC-17 rating for Requiem for a Dream, which complained that the studios are paying the budget of this aspect which give the studio leverage over the decision making with the major motion picture association rating system the aspect of the content protection efforts the Hayes code the don'ts and uh, be careful's law and act it's an aspect of will things change uh you know you never really know because the members of the original mpa were the big eight film studios and i know i said five or so in the beginning but these big eight film studios were paramount fox film lowe's universal united artists followed by warner brothers columbia pictures and metro goldwyn mayer but now the current members plus the year of their introduction is what i will you know explain to you paramount pictures uh, is part of this members and was inducted in 1922. Universal Pictures uh, was inducted in 1922. Warner Brothers was inducted in 1923. Walt Disney Studios in 1979. Sony Pictures in 1989. And Netflix in 2019. So uh, Netflix was approved as a new member in January of 2019, making it the first non-studio conglomerate and the first streaming service to be a part of the organization which is a big, big win for Netflix. But the addition of Netflix also helped maintain the number of members after the acquisition of 20th Century Fox by Disney, which the MPA aims to recruit additional members because of this. There are a lot of aspects to copyright infringements and then with the online file sharing, uh, the publicity campaigns, the accusations of copyright infringement, as I stated, and kind of the internal activities with the MPAA offices around the world. So, I mean, the MPA really, really has set a mark from when they began in 1922 to today of 2024. A lot has changed over the 100 plus years of the Motion Picture Association or the Motion Picture Association of America. And it really shows like some films should be certain ratings. Some films shouldn't. Some Pixar films should be rated PG. Some are rated G. Some films are rated R when they should be NC-17. A lot of horror films have really, really brought on the aspect of full-on 
gore body horror like Terrifier or the Hostel films. That's just full on body horror. And it's like, oh, you can categorize that and put that under the horror genre. But can you really? Because it's the aspect of horror is more so scary. Monsters, ghosts, demonic possessions. That's horror. Psychological horror is horror. When you have the aspect of body horror and gore, it's just like, there's too much of it. It's like, all right, let's, let's take it easy. Let's push it back a little bit. And those films should get an NC-17 rating. Sometimes they cut out one scene and it's rated R. But if they leave that one scene in, it's NC-17. So there's still some pros and cons about the MPA trying to fix the rating system. And from its heyday of 1922 to now, where back in the day, you had someone really, really trying to dictate how you should make a, a film in the industry when they didn't have a right to know how to make a film in the industry. But now you kind of have small free range of the film rating system, the piracy of it, the self-regularity of it, and all really, really makes sense. And with that, um, they should still figure out how to do certain things based on how to rate a film. Like I said, some films are rated R, which they should be NC-17. Some NC-17 films should be rated R. There are a lot of films that are distributed where it's an American aspect production. It's like, okay, that's not too bad. But then you have the European films, which is so far out there and advanced with horror and gore and the subject matter of rape and the aspect of certain things of drug use. It's just like... How, how does the MPA really solidify that, a European release into an American distribution for rating? So it goes to show that there's things have to be done with the motion picture production code, which is, you know, really, 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 really far gone. And you could say that Valenti really, really changed the aspect of how things should be done. And he was garnered as the man who kind of changed everything in the aspect of even though he was a politician and political advisor but he served as the longest president of the motion picture association during his 38 year tenure he created the film rating system and was generally regarded as the most influential pro copyright lobbyist in the world so i mean a lot of things can change a lot of things will change who knows if there will be a rating system after nc-17 will the x rating come back so many questions that still need to be answered, but for right now, the MPA really, really is doing their best job as to marketing out films the way they should be marketed out with green band, yellow band, red band trailers, and the rating systems of how everything works in certain genres of action, comedy, horror, and thrillers for that matter. So there you have it, everyone. This week's episode of the Mr. Filmstock Podcast, talking about the Motion Picture Association, the MPA, from its early history of 1922 up until today, over a hundred plus years of history. This was a fun episode to do. Uh, my research on it was absolutely amazing. I love researching topics for my podcast, especially if it has to do with film, television production, or anything to do with the industry. And as I stated at the beginning of this episode, I pick topics that I see that no one else talks about or no one else really wants to talk about or are afraid to talk about because I will talk about any topic, any subject matter, give my opinion on it, the pros, the cons, what I think should be changed, what I think should not be changed, and give a voice to the voiceless where it's like, okay, this is what Mr. Filmstock Anthony is talking about. Let's see and let's give an idea of the aspect of people want to get into the industry, but they don't know really the aspect of how the MPA works or how certain aspects works for that matter in the entertainment industry, especially if you're getting into it as I am. So there you have it, everyone, this week's episode of the Mr. Film Stock Podcast. If you're viewing this as a video podcast on my YouTube channel, thank you so much for tuning in. I'll leave a comment in the comment section below of what uh, topics and videos I should do, what subjects I should discuss, uh, what I should talk about that people don't want to talk about. Because like I said, I will talk about anything and give my opinion and pros and cons about it as to why. If you're listening to this as a audio podcast on Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts, thank you so much for listening and for, you know, having me progress upon with your day and just, you know, uh, talking about the industry and how I, you know, 
put my two cents into things that I think that should be talked about and things that, you know, that aren't talked about, which should be talked about, if that made any sense. So everyone, make sure you follow, subscribe, you know, hit that like button, give it some thumbs up, give it stars. It's been a really, really fun journey really doing this podcast. I've had lots of fun and it's only going to get better from here. And I can't wait to show you what episodes I have in store next. I'm Mr. Filmstock and you've been listening to the Mr. Filmstock podcast. (laughs) 